My uh, pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day, which is Dr. Mark Wigneris. I had the opportunity to review Dr. Wigneris' newest book, Premarital Sex in America, How Young Americans Meet, Mate, and Think About Marrying. And the book marries, if you will, large survey data with interviews with young Americans between the ages of 18 and 23. The book is an insightful examination of what young adults believe and hope for while challenging some myths and some preconceived conceptions. The material Dr. Rigneris explores in his new book has deep implications for the future of marriage in North America, and his book certainly does touch on that. Dr. Rigneris is an associate professor of sociology at the University of Texas at Austin, and he holds the position of faculty research associate of the university's Population Research Center. Before co-authoring premarital sex in America, he wrote Forbidden Fruit, Sex and Re Religion in the Lives of American Teenagers, published in 2007. And Forbidden Fruit reveals the complexity of teenagers' sexual decision making, documenting religion's effects, that religion affects the sexual attitudes, but that it does not often motivate the decisions to act. Instead, religion often accompanies other secular reasons for delaying sex, like concern for safeguarding one's educational future. Forbidden Fruit describes this largely religionless, middle class sexual morality in detail and concludes with a new typology for documenting how religion shapes human action among adolescents and adults. And you can certainly see, understand how these two books uh, are, are connected and, and in fact, I believe premarital sex in America sort of carries on from where Forbidden Fruit uh, left off. Well, Dr. Bernaris, has, uh, his work has been featured in numerous uh, media outlets, including the New Yorker, Dallas Morning News, New York Times, Washington Times, Time Magazine, uh, Psychology Today, The New Republic, and across the pond in the Daily Mail and The Guardian. He's also written op-eds and short articles uh, for the publications like Slate, in addition to over 30 academic articles and book chapters. And here in Canada, Dr. Ignaris has appeared on the agenda with Steve Pakin and was the subject uh, earlier this spring of a feature interview in Maclean's Magazine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Ignaris. It's good to be with you today. I appreciate the invitation. And uh, I want to share with you some, uh, s some aspects of this book, uh, especially the, the, the material on sort of how young adults, emerging adults, I'll call them, 18 to 23 year olds, think about marriage and how they negotiate sexual relationships that many of them are involved in vis-a-vis -vis what they think about marriage and when it's supposed to happen and what it has to do with uh, uh, their sexual relationships. Um, up until this point, my research interests have largely been in the sociology of religion, moved into uh, the study of sexual behavior, and now I'm starting dabbling in marriage and family. So I'm going to talk about some uh, American numbers, some Canadian numbers, and uh, basically, like I say, some realities, what's going on, some mentalities, what are people thinking about, and how do they think about this stuff, and some educated guesses about where we should expect to go in uh, the near future. Nowhere. OK. <laughs> Here we go. <clears throat> now, this is uh, some American data, and I'll shortly get to the Canadian data. But some outside observers uh, tend to look at the relationship scene among young adults and say, oh, this is all about hooking up, right? I mean, we hear a lot about hooking up. And we presume that the majority of emerging adults, 18 to 23 and sometimes well into the 30s, um, we presume that the majority of them are avoiding lasting and meaningful intimate relationships in favor of random sex. But in fact, most emerging adults do want to marry. In my own interview study, in uh, the online college social life survey and lots of other studies, most young men and women say they do want to get married. Not like 80%, we're talking 90, 93, 95%. Most just don't want to marry now or anytime soon. They don't feel any rush like previous generations might have. This slow but steady increase in the average age of first marriage to its present day 26 for women, 28 for men in the US, suggests that the purpose of dating, the purpose 
of cross-sex romantic relationships is changing or has changed. Most sexual relationships among emerging adults don't end in marriage. They don't end in cohabitation. They just end. And yet, ironically, plenty of emerging adults tell us they want to be married right now. In the largest data set that I use for this study, a uh, National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health, well uh, regarded in the US, 20% of single men between ages 18 and 23 said they would like to be married right now. 30% of women said the same thing. Among cohabitors, 50%, half of all cohabiting young women in the US said they'd like to be married right now. 40% of the cohabiting men said that. So it raises the question, well, what is preventing that? Okay? And so I'm going to talk a little bit today about mentalities. I really think we're social creatures. We look around at each other and try to figure out what it is we're supposed to want, what it is we're supposed to do. And clearly, when um, cohabitation has become a, a very a normative estate, we may want marriage, but if our peers are cohabiting, well, then I guess that's what we're supposed to do. Here's uh, some of the figures on age and marriage in Canada. From 2004, I, don't, I, I apologize for the datedness. I'm not sure why we had trouble locating more recent numbers. I presume there are more recent numbers, but they're helpful nonetheless. Uh, Canada seems like the United States with the earliest average ages at marriage in the heartland. Right? As you see down here, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. I tend to like to look at the medians. Um, these are the, the lowest. With moving towards the coasts, you get higher average ages. Um, and Quebec seems to be uh, not the highest, but close to the highest. I don't know what's going on in Yukon, but uh, they're not uh, getting together for warmth, that's for sure. <laughs> So, but for a little perspective here, in 2004, seven years ago, Canada was at where the United States has yet to be. The US age at marriage has moved up over a year, on average, in the span between 04 and 11. It doesn't mean Canada will have done so for sure. They probably did, but I'm gonna talk a little bit later about that there are reasons to believe that the the average age at marry, marriage does have a ceiling of sorts. So I'll mention that uh, towards the end. Now, back to the United States shortly. OK. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is the percent of uh, people who have never married over 40 years. Okay? So the story of marital shifts is twofold. It's not just about the rising age at marriage, because the people who are in the age at marriage statistics are still married. Okay? They get married. But the story is about people who are avoiding it altogether, okay, as well. That too is on the dramatic rise. Look at the American data portrayed here, especially showing this gap between 1970 and 1999. There is some action between here and there, but mostly it's in the span of 30 years, the share of um, young adult men, and I really focus on the the 20 to 25, 25 to 29, men and women who are not married at that gap has just exploded over 30 years. Just from 35.8, 36% of men 20 to 24 who were not married, had never married in 1970, now we're at you know, 83 and now 89%, such that it used to be a, clearly a minority behavior, and now it's sort of like, it is in the other direction. What kind of people, what kind of men are married before they hit 24, right? Which is, is ironic in the sense of, I always tell my students, the college experience is the largest, most expansive social network you'll ever be a part of. 
And it's not a bad place to meet somebody who you might want to marry, okay? But clearly, they're not taking that kind of advice. Um, and here, too, this is notable that 20 to 29 is basically the years of peak fertility for women. And you know, if you only want to have one or two children, typically there's time into the 30s. Um, but I mean, it, we are ignoring peak fertility when we um, uh, counsel people, and I, and I talk to my students, most of them don't even know about peak fertility. Okay? Uh, one of my criticisms of the pill, and it could go in both directions, is that you know, it's just, it takes, people don't even think about fertility anymore. Just, they don't have to understand their own bodies when there's a pill that will magically take all that away. So, especially by 2000, there hasn't been a ton of change since then, but it's noteworthy. Next slide, please. Back to Canada. Here we have age-specific marriage rates. And I don't want to, and this is just in the span of uh, from 2000 to 2004. My point is not going to be sort of, oh, look at that 58.7 to 41.9. How, uh, I mean, the, the, the numbers themselves, rates are often hard to understand. But my point is, look at the, look at sort of the significant change and drop in marriage rates in four years, OK? 17 fewer people per thousand in just four years at this peak marrying age. That's for men, and this is for women. And I thought, well, maybe it's backloaded, okay? So we're not getting married in our early 20s or mid 20s, or getting married later. But from this, it suggests that it's not backloaded because the marriage rates among the oldest in this sample also dropped over four years. So it's not as if we've just shifted all of this onto here. There's definitely a, a flight from marriage because at, the rates at all ranges are declining. And that was just four years. This can be difficult to notice out in public since we do have population growth that naturally occurs. We're all aware of marriages that are going on, their weddings, etc. But there ought to be a, a basically a steady marriage rate that reflects that, but that's not the case. In fact, it's the other way around. Next slide, please. So, why does the age at uh, marriage rise? Okay, there's a lot of reasons for it. I'm being a sociologist. I tend towards the uh, the social, the structural, the economic reasons. Um, insofar as marriage is associated with childbearing, and that's a debatable point. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But um, children are no longer the producers like they were. But that's been a long time since children were um, producers in the same sort of sense. I mean, pre-Industrial Revolution era. Um, <clears throat> so at, at, at one point, at some point, you would think, well, post-Industrial Revolution, um, the age of marriage should rise. Although, why did we see it in 1970 as sort of its modern lowest level, right? We also associate the 60s with the sexual revolution, okay? And people thwarting popular norms. Well, why then in 1970, 1972, 1973, why are the, the average age of marriage so low then? Well, in part because Revolutionary mentalities and practices are really, they're minority behaviors. They take a long time to really be uptaken uh, in the majority is what we're seeing, I suspect, more today. Um, the second more obvious reason is, well, there's been rapid expansion in the educational and occupational opportunities for women. Okay? And we can affirm that these are good things. They will, however, of course, push that age at marriage uh, up. Another thing I talk about extensively in the book that I won't talk about too much here is the low cost or the low price of sex. Okay? Um, in a nutshell, okay, uh, I argue that, and I'm not the first and won't be the last, that there's a, a, a sexual exchange between men and women on average. Um, men tend to want sex more than women do on average. And when you frame it like that, we understand um, that there is a, there's a pricing to sex. What does he have to do 
to access this thing that he wants, right? Today, not a whole lot, okay? Um, there's reasons for that, but uh, previous generations, he would have had to have shown more commitment, maybe uh, earning power, et cetera. Well, that's generally just not the case today. Uh, the longest chapter in the book is on this pricing business. I recommend it to you. Um, but, but frankly, when sex, does not, when, when sex does not cost much for men to acquire, they're, they're not going to give much, they're not going to commit much. And so it shouldn't surprise us that uh, it is associated with a, a rising age at marriage. Fourth, what about the cost of living in metro areas? 20 to 30 year olds are the people who most like to live in cities and in the sort of the hippest part of cities, okay? We know this. Um, but they're also at the, the point in their life course where they can least afford the kinds of places they'd like to live in, right? So thinking of marrying, thinking of childbearing, adding expenses at this time, um, oftentimes seems like the, the opposite of what they feel they need to do at that time. It does raise the question about affordable housing efforts, which, you know, the sociologist in me just, I like the idea of it, but sometimes I'm skeptical. I think that affordable housing can be sort of this, uh, a mask for wishing to live alone. Uh, I can't afford it. I can't afford to live in this nice hip part of town by myself. Rather than marry, I want affordable housing, okay? So I think that affordable housing doesn't improve marriage rates, although that is not a, 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 an established fact. So it's part structural, part cultural, and I tend to think that the structure really pushes and shapes what is cultural change. The more religious tend to want to marry on early, uh, earlier on average, but religiosity is associated with higher education, finishing uh, college, and they too want to start a career. So we're seeing average age at marriage rise among more religious folks as well. And the motivations for all of this tend to be couched in a variety of cultural stories and narratives that I will share shortly. Next slide, please. So we're avoiding marriage, but it's not like we dislike the idea. We hold it in great regard, high esteem. Maybe we even put too much esteem into it. At one level, though, it doesn't seem to be a matter of too much esteem. It's really a trade, back to that economic language. So in the mind of the uh, average emerging adult, I'm willing to trade my love of my autonomy, freedom to go where I want to do, hang out with my friends, etc. I'm willing to trade that if, and it's a big if, what I replace it with is clearly better. That's not this kind of same kind of trade as it was in the past, okay? What we had, freedom and autonomy, is largely more modern, right? I mean, think about youthful marriages uh, decades ago. They were trading relative poverty for it, right? More poverty, I think, than people tend to experience in uh, the 20s today. So we have to, uh, recognize that people are making in their own minds a larger leap to trade those things for this unclear, unsure idea of marriage than uh, their parents might have. The parents felt a lot more constrained. This is what you do, okay? Now we have to sort of really want it bad. <clears throat> they also receive little help, however, in their ideas of merging marriage with other life goals. I always say, uh, you know, people, home ec was sort of done away with home economics, even though I think home economics is probably one of the most versatile sets of tools that any young person would learn, how to balance their checkbook, relational skills, all these things that we totally need far into life. We don't even offer those anymore. We train you and we give 10, 15 courses on specializations and whatever in college, and, and they leave college not having a clue about some of the things that they will need to do for the rest of their life. They also really receive little help in understanding their early romantic relationships. I was talking with a student the other day 
um, who, even though she's from Texas, she was uh, fairly conservative, religious, didn't really, wasn't sure about marriage, didn't want to have any children. She's only 19. I'm, you might change your mind. Um, but she had a boyfriend. I said, well, what's he for, right? What are you doing? And so there was this sort of, and, and she struggled to, to articulate that, right? There's little help that we, people get into understanding um, their early romantic relationships and what the point of those relationships really are. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, and this I talk about in the book, cultural stories about marriage that, ref that are, uh, reflect what m emerging adults tend to think today. First, it's a very popular idea that there is no rush, right? We definitely saw that in the early slides, right? I mean, now we're at the upper 80s percentage of 20 to 24 year olds who are not, who have never been married, right? And I'm not necessarily problematizing that, but I'm saying they think there is no rush, okay? And sometimes there's this sense of, wow, if marriage is going to be for, for good, for life, and people still want to marry and stay married, and life expectancies are like 80 now, that's, that's a long time to spend with one person. Uh, so that thought intimidates some people, more men than it does women. Although, as most of us know, the, the statistics within marriage suggest that men tend to like it better than women do. So there's no rush. The second cultural story is um, you need to be your own person. And you just aren't your own person, apparently, at age 20 or 23 or maybe even 25. So the 20s, and to a lesser extent the 30s, are a time when people tend to think, this is the time to figure out who you are. It's a cultural mantra. Figuring out who you are obviously takes time. And marriage, to many, feels like it's like a full-time job or something. You have to stack it on top of your career concerns. I mean, it's, it's hard work. So uh, just to quote one of the, the young women in the study, her name is Clara. She articulated this identity formation argument pretty well. She said, I think the main thing is making sure that you are your own person. Because I know people who are getting married, and this is sophomore year of college, I'm like, you're not your own person. You're going to have some major changes. And you know, if, if at the end of 10 years after this, if they're going to be, you don't even know if they're going to be the same person you married. If you'll be the same person. So just make sure that you're your own person. That way you're ready to present yourself to someone else. It's a very confusing narrative. Uh, what does it mean to be one's own person? What does it mean to, ch to change? It's confusing, but it's compelling to a lot of people. Right? A lot of people think that um, they don't know who they are, what they want, and that the purpose of dating and relationships in the 20s is to figure out what you like. Okay? So the 20s and maybe uh, the early 30s are for experimentation. Later on is for the stable set of preferences. Because young adults uh, tend to think they will change what they like, change what they want. right? And that they, they, they honestly think that most of that change is going to be right in the 20s. Okay? I don't know that the, the evidence is, is sure that the, the, the 20s are the only time we change. right? Um, but like I said, I'm not defending these mentalities. Um, I'm saying this is sort of uh, cultural narratives about how emerging adults are, are thinking about and delaying marriage. Third, next slide please, is they think it's too soon to have children. Okay? Numerous interviewees responded to our question, why do you want to get married, with an answer that went something like this. Well, I want to have children. Many middle class emerging adults equate marriage with children. It's almost as if this, there, there's an older pre-contraceptive era mentality that hasn't died. I mean, the pill, like it or not, opened up opportunities for new aspirations to be fulfilled prior to parenting. Okay? You, could, you could marry and then not automatically have children. 
But in the mentality of a lot of emerging adults, like you marry and then you start having children. It's all part of a package deal in their mind. Obviously, though, this resists the idea of peak fertility that we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, it's a biological reality, which seems to aggravate a lot of emerging adults, right? Many of them don't want to think about it, don't want to talk about it. Many of them don't understand fertility, okay? We don't teach fertility. I take it upon myself to teach intro to sociology students just a wee bit about fertility because they need to know. It's hard to believe it. And this is not just Texas, believe me. And when I look at the religious uh, um, side of the equation, the religious emphasis seems to be more on sex, less on fertility. Next slide, please. Another cultural story that's popular is the 20s is the time to travel, which sort of consonant with that freedom narrative. Now is the time for freedom, exploration, experimentation. Uh, why exactly the desire to travel is presumed to interrupt or undermine romantic relationships that are on their way to marriage is unclear to me, but it remains a very common theme, right? We heard about it even from people who clearly did not have the means to travel, okay? It's just the idea of it together with the assumption that marriage nixes travel possibilities. It's as if marriage means children, it means work, a mortgage on the house in the suburbs, and the end of all things creative and spontaneous, things like world travel. On the other hand, I don't know about you, but marriage expanded my financial uh, resources. It didn't contract them. Um, it reduces expenses. We split things, and it opened up the possibility of travel in a way that being single didn't. <clears throat> Emerging adults also don't really recognize that this, this travel narrative is competitive with their sort of career building narrative, right? I mean, who has the time to go take a three-week vacation? When I was in graduate school and my wife was working full-time at a job, she got two weeks a year to travel. And you know, you, those two weeks have got to be spent visiting your parents, okay? So there's a little understanding that the travel possibilities are much better later in life than they are typically when you're in your 20s trying to build your career. Next slide, please. Um, there's a lot of parental resistance, and I think this is a profoundly influential thing. Parents are powerful and effective. If uh, young adults are rebellious, they're certainly not rebelling against their parents in this domain. Parental warnings about marriage tend to work. Uh, one of my graduate school colleagues published an article in a top sociology journal. She evaluated data from 341 women between the ages of 27 and 30, okay? She noted that with each incremental increase in the mother's preferred age of marriage for her daughter, so this was information both on what the daughter had done or not done and what her parents or her mother thought about, with each incremental increase in her mother wanting her to wait, she waited. The odds that her daughter would actually be married at the time had dipped 23% for each incremental unit increase in her mother wishing for her to wait. So what parents say matters even into adulthood. So they're telling us, finish your college, finish your graduate school, launch your career, become financially independent, don't become dependent on a spouse. Those things take a good deal of time. Uh, and another interesting thing to note is the people who marry without ever having cohabited are the least likely to ever have gotten financial assistance from their parents. <clears throat> it's, it's interesting. So we're more likely to subsidize people who don't marry or people who cohabit than we are to subsidize marriage, in part because we think marriage is the end of I mean, your dependence on us as a, a family. I get that. I don't know that it's necessarily always a helpful thing because we say you've got to accomplish these things first and those things take a good deal of time. Next slide, please. 
Another powerful cultural narrative out there today is you must find sexual chemistry. Okay? Uh, this is probably a byproduct and part of our scientific emphasis on uh, matching today. And we've extended that match business uh, into the bedroom. So chemistry is not just how well you get along, the conversations you enjoy, the hobbies you might share, religious commitments, political commitments, or shared ideas for the future. Chemistry is about how complementary you are in the bedroom. Is there sustained erotic attention? Does she do what he likes? Does he know how to please her? Are their sex drives comparable? Although sustained sexual chemistry takes time and requires real talking, many young adults believe it's supposed to emerge silently rapidly with the commencement of a sexual relationship. If it doesn't, or if the sex is awkward, or if the partner doesn't like the same things you like, a lot of people think that's a sign that sexual chemistry just isn't there and won't exist. Now, finding out whether you have sexual chemistry with someone precludes waiting very long to have sex. The presumption among many is that if the sex is bad, it probably won't get better, and continuing the relationship is a waste of time, which is why many emerging adults think it's a profoundly bad idea to avoid sex before marriage. Plenty of us think abstinence is a good thing, and that statistically it suggests, uh, or it, it's correlated with a stronger marriage and a more lasting marriage. Abstinence, in the minds of many, is a risk factor for divorce. So many emerging adults, except for the most religious ones, sense that it's a risk. To wait and see about sexual chemistry could reveal that it doesn't exist and perhaps can't exist. So they think that if, if you abstain until marriage, you're going to then reveal and seal poor sexual chemistry. And they think, that marriage can't possibly last. But it doesn't work that way. Back to my graduate school colleague's study. She found that the more premarital partners this group of young women had, the smaller chance that they reported being married. But the chemistry thing is a powerful mentality. Again, a lot of these things thwart the data. But it doesn't really matter because the power of a compelling narrative just sort of blows past data in most people's minds. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, finally, there's the, the deflated confidence in the institution. I know we esteem it a lot, but at some level, plenty of people don't trust it. Okay? The non-marital birth rate, we know, is skyrocketing and in the United States. Uh, among 20 to 24-year-olds, used to be a peak marriage time, the uh, non-marital birth rate climbed from 20% to 60% in the span of just under 30 years. Okay? I know it's overall it's about 41%, but among that uh, age segment, it's 60%. This is not a gentle slope. That's a huge mountain of change. Suggesting we're not so sure about marriage. We don't think it's such a good idea. In fact, we're more opposed to it than to having a baby outside marriage. That is a less, uh, I mean, that can accidentally happen, but you, it takes some, you can't accidentally get married. And so people are very hesitant about uh, marriage sometimes. That drop in confidence seems most pronounced among poorer and less educated Americans. Um, so this institution that we know keeps Americans from being indigent and dependent on state assistance is being shunned in some ways by the group that would most benefit from it. And that is discouraging. Next slide. So some of us wonder, is marriage deinstitutionalizing? Well, not if we think of deinstitutionalizing as disappearing. Okay? It is not disappearing. It does seem to be trying to find its way. Um, so we have non-marital childbearing it's eroded the norms about marriage as the primary place for raising children. 
cohabitation has eroded the norms about marital sex as the only place for legitimate sex. Changes in women's labor force participation, household divisions of labor, no-fault divorce advent, and the prospect or the realization in some places of gay marriage. All of these things sort of, they deinstitutionalize. They change what we think about marriage. Now, stating all that implies nothing about the wisdom of any of those things. But frankly, we have wanted most of those things. And giving a voting chance, most people will affirm those things. But they've come at a cost, generating what sociologists call unintended consequences. We want some things. We want marriage. And yet, the institution of marriage uh, thrives in um, settings that we have voted against at plenty of opportunities. Next slide, please. We also have sort of what we call the disappearing marriage naturalist. This is from a study about, uh, by Maria Kefelis, a sociologist, I believe, at St. Joseph's University. So now, as I've said, the story of marriage is pushed later into the 20s and to the 30s, uh, in part because we're, most of us are becoming marriage planners, not professionally, but um, we're, we think of marriage as something that has to be plotted, planned, and not naturalists, right? Marriage naturalists have a, lot, have a far more modest set of requirements for marriage. Once they're attained, building a life together seems more preferable to the marriage planner's preference for pursuing life goals individually. Okay? The naturalists seem to take marriage for granted. It's just the thing you do when you've been with somebody for a while. The planners think of marriage as a product. Marriage is something you earn, you work towards, less so as a producer. Marriage is something that produces something. That's a naturalist approach. So when we see cohabitation, we see non-marital childbearing and premarital relationships. She considers these things as placeholders right, for marriage among planners. Placeholders. We do those things, and they're keeping us on the pathway towards marriage. For naturalists, on the other hand, commitment is not something they fret about, think about, endlessly analyze, or fret over. It's as if we love choices, but we actually hate choosing. Next slide. Um, some research I've done on uh, religion in early marriage shows that it's a pretty strong effect, especially among men. Men among whom importance of religion is the most important thing in their life are far more apt to have become married by age 24 than people who th men who think it's not that important. And it's, it's a stronger, obviously, this barely matters at all to women um, in this domain. But it's a key predictor of men's interest in marriage. And it does raise the question at some level, is marriage going to become increasingly a religious thing? Are fidelity and monogamy, at bottom, religious issues? I cannot answer that one today. Um, one thing I, I, I tend to observe is that there, previously, and I'm not going back to a glorious past, but there were multiple institutions in society that channeled people towards marriage. And now it's just not that way. I mean, religious institution is, I wouldn't say it's alone, but it's certainly the primary uh, institution pressing people forward towards marriage. <clears throat> in conclusion, I want to peer into the future just a little bit. Here's what I think is going to happen. It's, these are educated guesses, and I'm just speculating on some of these things. I do think that at the age at marriage uh, rise will taper off. I think there are ceilings beyond which countries will not go. It does appear to be self-limiting. The proportion of people, however, who are married is continuing to decline. I think that will continue to decline. As a result, we're going to see marriage rates decline, as we saw uh, up there for Canada. And divorce rates will also tumble. Okay. So under current US law, 
I suspect divorce rates will always track with marriage rates, right? This is why you hear uh, states like Massachusetts say, hey, our divorce rates are low. Look at Oklahoma, look at Arkansas, what's wrong with them? These, because marriage rates and divorce rates under current law will just always track together. I do think the popularity of stay-at-home fathers, I've been asked about this before, uh, will quickly hit a ceiling. I mean, women seem to be thriving in this kind of economy, and men in the United States, uh, especially working class men, aren't so much. So there's suggestions, well, maybe they'll be just a stay-at-home dad phenomena. I don't think that will ever uh, become really popular. Um, I think that'll quickly hit a ceiling. Next to last, fertility is declining. Intergenerational relations uh, will suffer, in part due to this growing age gap between grandparents and grandchildren. If we are waiting to marry, and then if our children wait to marry, but you know, hey, we may we'll live to 80 years old. But I know uh, we didn't wait to marry, but our, uh, my in-laws had my wife a little bit late in life, and now none of my children have a grandfather, right? Which is kind of frustrating. I think that will only increase in uh, frequency in part because um, if multiple generations wait uh, to marry and to have children, um, you'll see that age gap increase and intergenerational relations will suffer. <clears throat> Some may wonder whether the higher fertility of cultural conservatives will win out in the end. Okay? Some people say cultural conservatives are more likely to have children. I'm not so sure. There, there's, there's a lot about modern life that turns people into pragmatists, planners, and delayers. Finally, in the US at least, and perhaps in Canada, we have the idea of moral hazard. Okay? A growing independence on the state. Okay? Once it exists, it's very difficult to undo. And arguments about it retain a moral sense to them. Social security, health care debates, etc. But we are becoming dependent as individuals on the state. Okay? And since independence uh, from marriage seems increasingly more than a personal choice, it seems like a right. right? People talk about, um, I'll notice this in media accounts, especially with the Great Recession, people said, would describe uh, the stories of people who were, you know, had to move in with their parents, or and they always sort of said, "Well, so and so was divorced." And I keep thinking, divorce, I mean, is not like a uh, a passive condition. It's something that people make happen. But there's a sense that you just shouldn't have to marry in order to do X, Y, and Z. So I uh, I'm going to stop there and take questions. Uh, and more of this you can learn about in the book if you want. Thanks. Uh, as Mark said, he will take some questions. Just a reminder again, if you could keep your comments uh, brief so we can get uh, more people through. Hi, I'm actually an endocrinologist, so your comments about fertility are very interesting because I see that in practice. It's become a multi-billion dollar industry right. for, for, young, for women now to have children because it's, and it actually is a problem for men as well. So it's, it's actually something that we probably should in, include in the, mm -hmm. the curriculums of, of younger kids even. Um, <laughs> my question was uh, uh, two things about example. Um, we recently had the wedding of our future king and queen. Um, and it was a, a state service in front of the church with a wonderful sermon by the Bishop of London. Do you think that will have any, any influence? Hopefully they'll stay um, married. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, with, I'm not going to speculate on whether they'll stay married. Uh, I heard, you know, I, I have written in favor of the idea of younger marriage, and by which I do not mean teenage marriage. Um, it's likely that that marriage will survive. I mean, in, in part because this is a couple that didn't just meet a year before or two, like uh, Diana and Charles, but sounds like they've known each other for a very long time. Um, I heard pieces of that, ser that sermon. I heard it was very good, etc. cetera. Um, I'm just not optimistic that such cultural, um, I mean, I'm happy about it, but I don't think in, in the long run that people watching it will sort of suddenly re 
acquire uh, an older appreciation for um, marriage, but I was very glad to, to hear it. So, but, but, but back about the, uh, the endocrinology thing, and um, before our third child, we had some difficulty getting pregnant, and one of the, the uh, nurses made this flipping comment that, yeah, you know, you spend your 20s trying to avoid getting pregnant, and then you spend your 30s trying to get pregnant. This isn't that ironic. Um, that wasn't quite the case with us, but it, it is an, an interesting uh, anecdote. Very interested in your comment about uh, intergenerational uh, relations will suffer, you say. Um, and I'm going to personalize it a little bit because it maybe helps to, uh, to ask my question. So uh, over 40 years of marriage, four adult children, the eldest married with grand, first grandchild and three not married, uh, all in your age groups mm -hmm. uh, or even getting to the far end of it. and. Uh, us, us, uh, other generation worrying. Right. Worrying. Yeah. It's a... Uh, uh, and um, uh, my, our thinking, my wife's and my thinking is that it has something to do with the loss of the sense of the sacrament of marriage. Mm -hmm. A little bit, uh, the same question just asked in a way, right. is that... Uh, we talk about how much work it was, our, our over 40 years, mm -hmm. uh, and how much, uh, well, uh, that, that was satisfying. I wouldn't right. say enjoyable, satisfying. Right. right. And that we say, how can we possibly uh, help my daughter, who is living with a guy who we think is terrific, and we tell them that they ought to get married, how do we... Uh, uh, communicate to them the sacrament of marriage and the wonders of marriage and how we can't support them till they are married because it's inappropriate that? as us yeah. as our daughter's parents to support our daughter and normalize the the lack of uh, of marriage in the equation right yet they're insistent on continuing Right. A little bit of a long question, sure. but I think you see at the heart, yeah. and I didn't see you answering that key question, and maybe it's because it's become irrelevant in Which our rampant question? individualism sure. that it's no exactly. longer important for my generation to say to the next generation that marriage is important. They've got to come to that decision themselves. Um, Thank you. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> A lot of stuff in there, and I'll try to yes. briefly get to it. Um, it sounds like you are and your wife are nat marriage naturalists, mm -hmm. like many people of a couple generations ago. It's just what you did when you were in love, and didn't really matter what age that was, and that was this next step. And somehow we gave birth to all these marriage planners, and we didn't even—I mean, we didn't teach them that necessarily, but they certainly caught it uh, from the world around them. Yeah, I do think. Um, I mean, I think the sacramental language around marriage is, is I find it very helpful, um, but it is a foreign language to plenty of people. Um, and I want to punt back a little bit to this economic stuff I talked about, uh, the low price of sex. Um, the price of sex has diminished over time for lots of reasons, one of which you know, certainly has you know, is the, the advent of the pill. Not just the advent of it in 1960, um, but its slow uptake over fi the past 50 years, such to the, uh, till we get to a point where young men and women really don't know why they ought to marry because they can mimic all aspects of marriage without really having to do that last thing, right? And I, I tend to think, you know, <clears throat> Women like the idea of marriage and would prefer it more than men. But men don't have to be compelled. I mean, what compels men to marry, right? I mean, uh, the sexual aspect of a relationship is always a little bit probably more focused in his head than in hers. And he gets access to this thing. And so now we're faced with all, you know, cohabiting couples and you would like to them, for them to get married. Um, but what is it that, I mean, you, you try your best to haul out any sort of arguments, but really cohabitation, thanks to uh, reproductive technology, just mimics uh, marriage 
in all ways except uh, this, this sort of this sacramental union. And so, um, when, that is a certainly a tactic that you uh, can do. Right, you don't wish to do it. Although, the thing is, I always think some people, everything used to channel people to get married. And so if, if those channels are, are not there anymore, how are we going to accomplish this, right? I mean, and so you have authority in, to some degree and some power as a father in the ways you mentioned. Um, I'm a consultant pediatrician in town and also a mom of two young children. So I read a lot of parenting theory both professionally and personally. And so there's a term that I found that you're kind of missing uh, in your presentation. Maybe it's in the book. But when you look at your cultural stories about delay of marriage being because you have to become your own person and then also linked with parental resistance, and then maybe that graph that shows the jump in between 1970 and 99, you don't talk about the helicopter parent phenomenon, right? right. And so the product of people of, you know, in their 20s, maybe early 30s, would be, like, it's all related, you know, delaying it in delaying fertility and marriage from the 70s and 80s may have produced sort of children that are attached right. still by right. the umbilical cord. Mm -hmm. And so it actually fits very nicely to say, sure, they haven't been told or equipped to be their own person, so right. why should they get married? And that's, right. and then the extension of that parent is still a helicopter because they want them to become financially independent, but there's no impetus to become financially right. independent. Right. So do you mention helicopter parenting? I don't mention helicopter parenting, because uh, largely I don't get into parenting uh, studies, but I think that makes a good deal of sense. Uh, some of that is connected to diminished fertility as well. I mean, on average, you know, if you have four to six children or something, you just can't hover over them all, right? If you have one or two, you can be a much better hover. I have three, which... <laughs> Which leads me to like, do I hover? Do I just give up? Right. Uh, so, because um, it's a lot of work to hover, right? And so, and, and you want to protect your children. And there's this perceptions that the world is more dangerous than it probably actually is. It's self-perpetuating as well, and it's going to get worse, right? Because if you delay marriage to have, delay fertility to have one or two children, then those two one or two children are so precious. Not that all right. children yeah, are. Sure. Is that then you'll never let go of them and so anyway I think that that piece the parenting part probably has to reverse a bit to see any change in the stats. Yeah, I would agree. Thanks. You have some busy tables there at the beginning of your presentation and one of them shows that uh, if I uh, read it right one of them shows that the number percentage of uh, men uh, who remain unmarried at age 40 has uh, quadrupled between uh, 1970 and 2010. But the percentage of women who remain uh, unmarried mm -hmm. in the same uh, time period only doubled. Only doubled. So my question is, why is that? Sure. Uh, number two, if the women still marry at twice the rate of men, who do they marry? <laughs> women are not marrying at twice the rate of men. Okay, so what you're, what you're seeing is not a, a, it's a marriage rate, it's a share of people at a population or at an age group who are currently uh, never, have never been married. So <clears throat> one shouldn't, uh, if you want to flash that one up, right? It's uh, one before that, I think. That was before, yeah. That's the right there. Um, Men who are, men are marriageable later into their life course on average than women, okay? So you'll have some 45 to 50 year old men who marry 40 to 44 year old women. You'll have a lot more of a women here married than here, okay? So men on average have an age gap of about two and a half years uh, on women, right? And I think that is going to increase over time. So one can't look at this and say double the number of women are married, um, or double the, the, the rate as, uh, of women are married than men, um, because women will marry on average younger than here. So 
these men will be marrying these women on average, right? So especially when you get up to age, I mean, my, uh, my dearest friend married at 42 to a woman who was 31. So that's a much more common age gap between men and women at that age. So, so one shouldn't look parallel when one looks at a, a graph like that. I was just going to ask you. Uh, if one I think we're still one. good. You'll, you'll shut me down, right? Um, okay. Yeah, just on what you were saying, a, a friend of mine married at age 50 to his 48-year-old uh, common-law wife because the kids kept asking, when are you and dad going to get married? <laughs> And, yeah. and they They're actually funny. finally took the step. But it, it brings up an interesting situation where uh, legally and intellectually, um, they had, since their university days, considered themselves married because mm -hmm. they were cohabiting. Um, and I'm wondering if your research seems to suggest that um, emerging adults still see marriage as a distinct phenomenon, as a step that right. you actually take whatever the legal process or whatever your own intellectual mm -hmm. response to it is, that it, you know, if you're cohabiting, you're right. married. Is, is that in fact the case? Certainly in the United States, marriage is, uh, I mean, I think marriage in the United States and Canada is a comparable idea. What is different is cohabitation. I mean, we don't even use the term common law really there much because there's this mentality like there are different types of cohabitations. We now, in the U.S., the average age at first cohabitation is the average age at first marriage 30 years ago. So people are still angling to get together in the early 20s. They just, they used to marry, now they're not marrying, but are cohabiting. But there are different kinds of cohabitation, but sort of common law with long-term intentions to do this is mm, less common in the U.S. than in Canada. Okay, so it is a genuine distinction, not just kind of I think nominalism. so. Okay. Okay about that, not so much about what marriage is and means. Hey, well, All right. I want to take an opportunity to, uh, to thank Mark. We have a little token here. Uh, just found that uh, very insightful and uh, a, lot to, a lot to think about. Um, we have, uh, coming up next is a break, and uh, you have until 10.45, that's correct, Dave? Uh, there's some coffee in that, uh, so please, oh, it's, out, it's outside the room. Oh, and there's goodies outside the room. Uh, so please enjoy that, and then we will reconvene at uh, 1045. Could I have our speakers and our IMFC staff gather here at the front for a photo op, please? <laughs>